Hello and welcome to the PD Performance Podcast. Today's episode of the podcast is a conversation with Daryl McGurn of Fermanagh Gaelic Footballers. Fermanagh had a tough loss to Derry at the weekend in the Ulster quarterfinal, so that was a big topic of conversation. We also talked a lot about leadership amongst the group and culture and communication, driving on standards to an elite level at inter-county level. We talked a lot about mindset. We talked about physical qualities and developing speed and change of direction. We talked about having a choice as to if you want to participate in an inter-county setup or not. And it was just a really, really valuable conversation, a really enjoyable one to record. So I hope it's an enjoyable one for you guys to listen to. And if you do enjoy it, please remember to like it, share it and send it. Darren McGurn, welcome to the PD Performance Podcast. Uh, great to have you on. Big trip up to Enniskillen today. Obviously, we're going to talk a little bit about what's transpired in the last few or in the last week since the Ulster quarter final. But how are you and what is on the agenda for today? Not too bad, PD. Um, probably same as every other day, sitting in a coffee shop with laptops. <laughs> yeah, as Sean Quigley said, but um no. Still probably trying to get over last weekend, to be totally honest, but um, I think it'll move on at some stage. So the actual hangover has subsided, but what about the figurative hangover of the defeat? Is it still kind of lingering? Are you still like thinking about the game and what could have went different ways or what you could have done differently? Or have you had a chance to refocus yet towards Tadhan Cup? I think it's only natural for it to be going through my head um, and probably will do for another while yet just given the fact that there's no game now for another three and a half weeks um, I suppose it was one of those games where we looked like we would never we could, we could have played for another three hours and we wouldn't have won the game so it's different when you lose a game by two or three points and you're kicking yourself over small things that went wrong but I think there was a lot of things went wrong in the game for us. We probably didn't set up correctly. Um, we we didn't feel like we were at their level um, for a number of reasons, and that's probably why, um, you know, it's it's probably it'll linger for a while. But um, I suppose there's that many learnings to take from it. That's all we can really do at this stage is just learn from it and move on. Um, and now prepare for the Talent Cup, which is. To be honest, something that we were aiming for at the start of the year anyway was was to get around the Talent Cup and, and to hopefully push on and train with us. One thing about the game though is that he didn't really lose the like he didn't stop fighting. Mm-hmm. Was that even more frustrating in that they were so relentless that if he went and nabbed the point or nabbed the goal, they went back down the field and they just didn't give up. Yeah, trying to pummel you into the ground, which all good teams do. Like, yeah, I think that's just something Derry have is that just ruthlessness. Um, and like even you seen when we got the goal and brought it back to seven, it was literally the next play that they won the kick out. It was nearly pre-recorded. They they won the kick out and just ran straight down the throat of us and got a penalty. So it's very demoralizing in a game like that, and um, when something like that happens, um. But I suppose that's what you're dealing with when you play the top teams. Um, and I suppose if there's anything we can take from it, it's the fact that we got the, the opportunity to play a team at that level um, and have probably learned things in that game that we could have never learned playing against lower level teams. And that's the value you probably get when you do play top level teams, which we'll probably have the opportunity to do next year um, now that we're in Division 2. How much do you think of their ability to go straight down the field in that pre-recorded um, play to go down and win the penalty comes from just them having such mental belief in themselves that, well, we're not going to lose this. So yeah. let's just regroup, go back down the field and get a goal. I think like, when it comes to the higher level teams, there's just players throughout the team that have that ruthless mindset. So... As soon as we scored that goal, there's probably 14 players, 14 outfield players, 
thinking, right, I'm winning this next ball and I and you know, I'm gonna turn this momentum. Um, I'm not gonna let that happen. And I suppose back there he won an Ulster title last year, probably has brought them on to that next level mentally. Um and you, you see that at all the top teams, even you would have seen with the teams like obviously Dublin, uh, in the last number of number of years, just ruthless mindset like um and I even heard Paddy Andrews talking there on a podcast this week about just small things that you do in a game that turns momentum. Um, whether that be going down for an injury, whether it's winning the next ball, whether it's keeping for two minutes, it's just small things that they're dragging that down, dragging that down. Yeah, it's just the higher level teams. I think have that knack and they have it throughout the team. Um, yeah, and that was evident, I suppose. So, like this year, as you push for promotion and pushed on the levels that are expected from the group. Is that something you've been focused on in that you just touched on there, like the 14 outfield players or 1 to 15 and the subs as well? If something goes against you, you're not going to let it get to you. You're just refocusing on your next job and you're wanting to have everybody on the team and on the field keen to get into the position for the next opportunity whereas you've been involved for a few years now is that something that's been steadily changing whereas you would have relied more on other players in the past yeah I think well for us anyway when you're trying to get to that next level it's about trying to get more lads on the team who have that sort of mindset and the more lads that you have on a team that are at that level the better um, I think like it's not something we've la- lacked massively, but I think it's something that naturally improves and comes on to that next level when when you are winning games and you're you're getting well I suppose from getting from division three to division two um obviously we do have more lads that are at that level um and we like I suppose we're a young team so it's it's probably going to take time as well to get everyone up to the pitch of that from one to 30 um, but I suppose it's something that's j- is just coming from winning games I wanted to ask you because before the game and in the couple of podcasts that yourself and Sean did the Talton Cup was mentioned before you even went out so I wanted to ask what was the belief like in the dressing room amongst the squad prior to taking the field or in the week long build up were you talking about going out and beating Derry or was it very much like we're going to go out and give it our best shot no the talk was we're going out and we're going to beat Derry so then in your group meetings and your team meetings when you're talking about the Talton Cup already do you find that that is more realism or is it there a bit of like a defeatist attitude in that you're like expecting that you're going to be in Talton Cup rather than down the road in the All Ireland or win the Ulster. Yeah, it's it's a funny one, and it's probably not spoken about. Um, as you said, like when you, when you're at that level, you you're only thinking about the game in front of you. So we probably didn't speak that much about Talton Cup during the year. Mm. It was more at the start of the year. You okay, know, yeah, I get like, you. Um. But no, we had full belief we were honestly, and that's not, not me just, you know, talking shade or anything, but yeah. um, when you put in so much in preparation, I think as a collective, you, you get to that stage where you're just convinced that you have enough, you've done enough, you've, you've looked at the opposition enough um, and you can go on. And you know, like everyone there knows that you'll need a lot of things to go right for you when you're playing a team that's at that level. But you have belief that that can happen. And if everything does go right for you, that you're going to win the game. Um, As I've said, even in a post last night, Instagram, like, there's things that you can't control. We can't control the quality of Derry. We can't control the tactics they're going to bring. Um, You don't know what that's... You don't know what they're going to bring, really, until you get on the field. Um. Obviously, when we get onto the field, we you realize what they brought. They, you know, they brought new things that they hadn't brought to the league. 
they brought a level of hunger and aggression that we mightn't have seen in previous games. So, like, you can have all the belief in the world, but sometimes you just go out and there's an opposition that's just at another level. Mm. But you mentioned there a couple of times about system and tactics and then speaking about playing a team of a different level. You get the old adage at times when a lower division team plays a higher division team or they couldn't win because they weren't fit enough. But it seems like you have realised from playing at that level, as all good inter-county players do, is the difference in physical fitness are not major when you get to inter-county level. It's more about like the team's fitness to execute the game plan and the tactics. Yeah. Was that something that when you first came into inter-county football shocked you a little bit? It probably it probably was a wee bit. Um yeah, like at, at times you think by looking on um when I wasn't involved, you're like, geez, the teams at the at the top level are just so be- much better conditioned. Mm. And it's just not the case. Like, um there's just so many other things that come into it, as I said quality of player, quality of opposition. Um, as you said, ability to actually, you know, do the tactics or whatever it is um, that has been lined out. And picking the right game plan, is that? And picking the right game plan. Like, that's something that at, at the weekend was lambasted from us that we hadn't set up the correct way. But, like, hindsight's a great thing. Mm. And, and but you changed as well at half time slightly like in terms of what you were doing did you? I thought you did we, we didn't change massively like what people didn't see in the first half was Derry were attacking with 15 players if you put 13, 14 players inside an opposition 45 you have to mark all of them like we had went out with the intention of having a sweeper but they didn't allow that to happen because they just pushed every single player up into our half and that's what people weren't really willing to see. Of course, we could have defended a lot better in certain situations. Like it was, it was brutal at times, um, and that just wasn't good enough. But in terms of how you set up, I think the opposition can dictate sometimes what way you set up, and that's what I thought Derry did at, at the weekend. Um, to an extent, obviously, then there's other ways that you can defend, defend as well. You can just put fifteen in inside your 45 and, and go really narrow which we probably didn't do and we probably could have did better at times um, but but this, this, as you said like what faced you was not what you expected at all like, no. so you had to adapt in the moment and it's I know I'm biased now and you're probably equally as biased as me but it's the speed at which those top teams make decisions and then execute them yeah. and then if you're going to defend them it's the speed with which you can identify what they're doing and adapt. And it sounds like that was maybe the what was missing mm-hmm. or what you needed to do quicker, essentially, in order to <laughs> handle Derry and then hopefully get the ball and go down the field, Yeah, which is easier said than done. I suppose it's another quality of top teams is the ability to adapt in games. And it's probably something we still haven't got to the level of yet. Um, you know, 10 minutes into that game, we could have probably on the field ourselves started to realise things better and, and change them. Um, but when you're coming up against an opposition that has maybe seven, eight players that you need to man mark, it makes life very difficult. Um, so I suppose it's, it's trying to find that balance when you are coming up against them teams um, of man marking lads, but then marking space as well. Um, and it's something that not many teams have cracked, I think, playing Derry in the last two years. Yeah, quite a strong team. And the, they have as much chance as anyone in goal on and winning the ultimate thing. Like, 100%. You touched on there, like, adapting to what's in front of you. And from the conversations you've had this year already, it's clear that you're really focused on improving the culture of the group and of... Gaelic football as, as an elite level in Fermanagh and it sounds like you're very open as well as a group like lads aren't afraid to say the things that need to be said 
has the communication aspect been a focus for you? Is it something that you've been talked about? Or is it actually the other case that lads are so willing to say the things that sometimes lads have to be pulled up and say, well, look, is that constructive or is it not? I don't think it's something that's changed massively. And that's just being honest since I've come in. Um, we always had big leaders and communicators in the squad. And to be honest, we probably lost quite a few of them in the last five, six years. Um, big players for Mana, and it's something the boys have had to step up in the last number of years and do more of. Um, <clears throat> in terms of honesty in the group, like it's, I think that again, that's something that's always been there, maybe more so now. Um, maybe more so now, but but again, um, as I said, I, I still think that was always there. And I think it's a quality of all inter-county teams that you need. You need that honesty. You need boys calling out driving standards um, on the pitch and off the pitch. Um, so, Well, I don't know if it's a quality of all inter-county teams, to be honest, there. But the ones that are going to be successful, then they have to do it. Yeah. It's still, and again, it's still something I think we can do better. Mm. Um, I don't think we've mastered that at all yet either um, I still think there's a lot of standards that we could do better and drive drive better and I suppose again as I said our, our squad's fairly young so it's something that probably boys are going to start having to drive on more so and now that we're up in Division 2 um, but as I said when I first came in there was there was big leaders in the team and you wouldn't have got away with much at that stage either um, So what are the standards then that you mm-hmm. believe need to be improved? Or what are the small things that are picking at you? Because I can see <laughs> from you there are a few things that are picking at you. Uh, Without calling anyone out specifically, obviously. Calling myself out. Yeah. <laughs> um I suppose I'm I'm no saint either when it comes to a lot of standards and even to be things where I'd be saying to myself I shouldn't have been at it or shouldn't be doing it. But like I, I think it comes down to your lifestyle off the pitch. Um what are you doing? Are you going out too much, what's your nutrition? Like, I think nutrition's a big one too because no one really sees what you're doing at home or any lads doing. And so it's it's a hard one to drive. Um, standards on the pitch in terms of how hard you're actually training um, is another one. I think it's, it's, it's hard to fully drive that, but it's something that I think we could do better. Um, demanding quality training sessions, demanding... Um, demanding that all lads are doing all S and C work. I think all of those there's there's a lot of small things that go into it. Um, it's the one percenters, is it? The, it? It is the one percenters, and it's the one percenters that probably get overlooked a lot of the time, um, because it's it's pretty easy to just not bother doing them, um, and I could, you could go into depth and loads of different things, but you'd be nitpicking then, I suppose, and and maybe even at the highest level they aren't. You might be thinking they're they're being done, but they mightn't be either. Um, but then again, there's certain players that don't need to do all those things either, and that's always going to be the case. Um, a lot of players will get away with it, and probably as well, certain players will will play better without actually having to overthink those things. Um, and then there'll be other players where you think they could get that extra few percentage by doing them. Um, but. I don't know if I go into that much more detail. <laughs> yeah, it's a difficult one to navigate as well, especially when dealing with a group or coaching a group because what's good for one person is not good for another. And you want everybody to turn up on game day mentally switched on to play the best, but also from a physical standpoint to be the best that they can be as well. So... One lad might like having a chicken roll before the game. And if he goes into the game feeling good, you're not going to try and change that meal for him um, prior to the game as minimal an effect it's going to have. Like, yeah. And that's just a, a silly example. But it's just because you outlined there around nutrition. And I think when we talk about inter-county athletes, a lot of the time people think just clean, healthy living nutrition is just next level. Like. Yeah. Um, and from my dealings with intercounty athletes, 
not all of them now, but some of them, even at a, a younger age level, under 20, under 18, some of the thought patterns around nutrition and maybe like maybe they're just on TikTok a little bit too much, but some of the stuff they come out with is mad. And you realize that a lot of the time it's just the basics that need to be hammered with them to see some level of improvement. For for you in your role. Do the boys be asking you much around your opinion on what you're doing? Do they be quizzing you or do they kind of just let you be Dara or teammate when you're in there? You you wouldn't get quizzed anyway. Um, you get the odd question. I think boys probably see enough of, of what I do. <laughs> on many, many you might not say that. You go and do the opposite of what I'm doing then. Um, but no, like, as I said, I'm constantly putting stuff up. So I think they... They, maybe they do take tips and stuff and of what I'm what I'm doing. Um, but as I said, I still don't think people let our athletes at intercounty level even dial that in as much as they could or even close to it. Um, I think if you went and followed a fellow GA player around on his day before a game, you'd probably be shocked at how much he's leaving on the table. In that regard, You've said about losing some very senior players over the last couple of years, and then you've mentioned leadership a number of times. And obviously with the honesty and the communication and driving standards in that regard, it benefits you lads to have more leaders in the team. And obviously you're stepping into a key role with the group. So has that been something that you've been consciously focused on this year in developing your leadership qualities, or are you just trying to lead by example in what you're doing? I think it's a mixture of both. Um, like you can't just go out and start leading by words if you're not leading by actions. It just comes across false and stupid. But I I try and do a bit of both. Like I think leading by your actions both on and off the pitch, I'd always try and do that anyway. Um sometimes people might think the opposite, but on the pitch, but um I think I, I try and be vocal when I when I need to be. I wouldn't be someone who just goes out and is constantly talking and constantly in people's ears. But if I feel like that's something that I want to say or need to say, um, whether else tactically or or whatever else, um, I will I will always say it, even if it's in you know in video from four games and stuff. I'd be vocal enough if I have something to say. Um, but it is something that, uh. I like having as part of my game, probably at club level more so even. Um, I think it's important when you are a key figure in a, in a team or you're in a key position that you are vocal um, on the pitch, more importantly probably, um, when it comes to just, you know, leading in terms of kickouts or, you know, when things are going wrong for a team. I think it's important to have those those players in a team to, to drive other lads on because you are going to have lads who are quiet um, and would probably need that as well. I am interrupting the podcast to let you guys know that there are two spots available in the PD Performance Premium Pack for May. Now, this could be online coaching, this could be in person coaching, but I am closing the group to a limited number of people because. I want to deliver the best quality service to the people that are in the group and things have been going really, really well. So I've been left with two spots for May and I've also been left with two spots for June. People have been signed up for June as well, which is absolutely unbelievable. So we are almost full, but if you want to avail of some online or in-person coaching or maybe the hybrid service, make sure you message me as soon as possible so that you don't miss out. We're delivering high quality care of strength and conditioning to mostly club level GAA players, but some county level players as well. And we've been getting great feedback about the service. More and more people are joining, which means that we've been doing something right. So if you want to be one of the members of the exclusive group, the PD Performance Premium Pack, message me ASAP so that you don't miss out for May and June. And now, back to the podcast. In the way that you fit into the group then, obviously you're on, as you said, it's a young group, but over the last few years, you have had a bit of a transition from the more senior players 
transitioning into other roles in the group or transitioning out of the group. Do you view yourselves as a team in transition at all? Or do you think that a lot of the players that come into the setup are now finding their feet and are comfortable in the setup and you're going and attacking what you want to attack and attempting to hit your goals in the next couple of years? You need to realize your potential essentially. Yeah, like I, I don't think we're in transition anymore. I think if you had asked me that question last year or the year before, I probably would have said we are because obviously you had the Hogan Cup winning team, St. Michael's, they won that. That's four years ago now at least. So I think we're at a level now where basically I've won in the team, bar maybe one or two. Um, have been on the senior panel and, and been playing regular inter-county football for three plus years um, and now we're after we're after making a big step this year obviously in, in getting promoted so I don't feel like we're in transition anymore I think the time is now to go on and push on and start winning things and Romana hasn't won anything in over 20 years 25 years I think it is maybe maybe more um, so it's about it's about not wasting any years talking about transition anymore. I think um it's actually something I'm probably sick of listening to from a lot of people. Um because you could talk about transition for years and, and you you'll realize then <laughs> you've won absolutely nothing. It's gone past. Yeah. yeah. So when you look around the age profile of our team, when you look around the level of the players in our team, there's plenty of experience there. There's plenty of quality and it's about time now we just started actually going for things and, and winning them it sounds like you talk about your goals and what you want to achieve an awful lot more like you're becoming bold enough to like say this yeah. is what we're capable of and this is what we're going for mm -hmm. do you think that comes from having a little bit of a younger group who aren't afraid to say it it probably does it probably does I think it comes from teams within the county winning things and having that drive and ambition and other other players feeding off that. Um as I spoke about the, the whole winning team when nearly everyone in the county seen that it, it, it gave it a massive lift that the Romana teams can win things, win things at a high level at, at that. Um and like we're operating in the division we were in division three this year. Like if if those players aren't capable of, of pushing on the senior level and winning things at that level, then there's something wrong. So um I think yeah, we, we there's there is a bit of hunger and, and drive in the team. Um and as I said, players have been feeding off other players. Um and I think the belief the belief is there. I, I'm not saying the belief wasn't there before, mm -hmm. but I think the talent cup has helped things massively because that wasn't there before. So the only real aim was winning your division or winning Ulster and Fermanagh has never won an Ulster title, um, which is probably why that's always been a big ambition. But now the talent cups there, it's a really realistic thing to, to push on and try and win. I assume you've met up as a group since the game at the weekend already. Have you started refocusing and talking about Talton Cup yet? Like, do you know what the next few weeks looks like, how it's mapped out, and or have they given you some time to yourselves to just Yeah, we've we've had a week off now. Um, and have you been texting the boys? Had a few pints with them. <laughs> yeah, well, you you talked about it then. I'd say, but you can't remember. Yeah, that's it. Um, no, we we haven't spoke about it that much yet. Um, the fact it's a group stage format too, it's not knockout. Kind of gives you that extra bit of time as well. Um, to digest whatever went on at the weekend, and then and then plan for the next number of weeks. But we're like we're still we haven't took a week completely off. Mm -hmm. We took a week off. I mean collectively, yeah. Um, but we're still doing work this week to to get us in to start building our our level of conditioning and our level of you know whatever else to, to get prepared for those games. And um, because like it's going to be a massive part of our year over the next two months. Um, and it's something that I'm actually kind of excited and looking forward to. Um, last year we we went into the the Thailand Cup and we 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 had good belief last year that we could win, but the team this year and the squad is just at a completely different level, um, and and that's kind of getting me a bit excited for 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 what's ahead. Like, 
does the week away from collective training give you a little bit more hunger to get back in do you think like you're like okay we need to get back to it now 100 percent, 100 percent. um if we had it went straight back into training there on tuesday night it just i don't think it would have done anyone any favors if i'm being honest um just getting that refreshed mentally um like I can guarantee you now, everyone will be buzzing to get back next Tuesday, and um, when it does come around, and um, boys have had that time to even just go away. Like I know a few lads went away on holidays and time away off work, and um, nights out meeting friends. Like those things go a long, long way in a team setup. Um, it's been a long year. Like already, you, you can start in early December. That's week game on, like a a, a game every week for eight or nine weeks I think it was like even when you're in the middle of the league and you have a week off you were having a friendly like so there was no real break at all until until now so I think it's it's something that's underrated is it's taking a, a break like this and to just have time off and refresh and and as you say just gather that hunger again to go again that's something that's changing in the GAA now thank God is that if you're going away and you're taking that break that is deserved and needed, management and players with each other are having more trust with each other that they're going to do the right things in that week away. You're not going to go on the beer five nights in a row and, and go eating shite essentially and you look after yourself and you'll get to the gym and you'll get to the pitch and you'll do your extras because if you're not doing that, why are you here? Exactly. It's something that needed to change though as well, isn't it? Because we were speaking earlier about the old recovery sessions the day after a game and how they were nearly thrown in as a case of, right, well, they can't stay out till 4 a.m. if we throw a recovery session in tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Whereas you need to trust that lads are going to stay out till 2 a.m. and go to bed. (laughs) Maybe maybe you're wrong in doing so, but even if they don't, they're better off sleeping the next day and recovering than getting them in collectively and just mentally and physically burning them out. Yeah. I think that level of trust is is hugely important. Um, I think it comes comes back to standards as well. Like when you have that trust in a group and you have a group that's got ambitions to push on and win things. If if there is lads that if you do give them a week off and, and there's lads going and drink for the full week, it's going to be called out and it's going to be frowned upon. So. You're more than so proud of like, More than frowned upon. You could get the boot. So, like, I think when you have that level of trust, it goes a long way. Um, and it creates a better relationship too. I think with coaches and management and and everything. Um, that you come back and you've got that hunger and, and drive to push on. Um, I think some sometimes it could go the opposite way if you don't give lads that time. Um, you can get just lads kicking the head up or. You know, talking behind the back or whatever it is, um, and that's not that's never a good thing either in a team setup. Like, no, it has to be called. It has to be said to the person, and it has to be called out. Mm-hmm. But we we're talking a lot about the changes and the changes in professionalism, in the trust, in how an intercounty setup is run, and how athletes run inside of it. And from your interview on the GAA social, it and from just your online presence and social media, it's clear that a lot of people view you somewhat as kind of one of the new breed or the new age county player. Does that sicken you here and that, or what does that mean to you? I think, well, do you mean in regards to just like physically? Is a I think age? in regards to everything, you're nearly viewed yeah. as like, yeah. this is what the new inter-county player is going to be like. I think it... You take that you it's, welcome the physical, obviously. Yeah, but sometimes I feel like it's an excuse that you know they don't want to do that side of things. But I just think like if just the way everything's gone now, um, it would be silly not to make use of all the extras that are going to push you on and, and make you a better footballer. Um, I know Sean talked about on his podcast about <laughs> right. <laughs> There's not as many popular going about these days. Um and maybe he has a point, but I just my viewpoint anyway. Um I always as a youngster, I don't know if I ever I would have been able to express my footballing ability if I didn't go and 
completely transform myself physically. Um, it gave me a platform to go on and express my my footballing ability at a higher level. I thought, and there's I think a lot of GA players around the country are are going down that avenue as well. Um, maybe Sean is a point in the fact that there's boys that that have absolutely zero footballing ability and are making it just mm. simply because of that, and and that's probably true as well. But I think there's a balance there as well. Um, where the best footballers can also make themselves elite top end footballers um, by improving those areas every single aspect of their life um, as they'd say just a better lifestyle um, we go hand in hand with being a county footballer I understand what Sean is saying as well like, yeah. and I think the issue in regards to there not being enough as many footballers as he said is more so maybe an issue in regards to coaching and being very system orientated and being completely um, not able to try anything as a player yeah. and not willing to take that risk, just wanting to stick to the system and I'll just catch the ball, I'll run up here and I'll hand pass it off and then I'll go back and I'll fill the role. Uh, I'm not going to try anything. And that partly comes from the player being willing to do it and partly comes from the coaching style and given the opportunities to make mistakes in training and in, and in games. But I think, like as you've just touched on there, improving the physical, be that speed, agility, change direction, your strength, your conditioning, your fitness, is only going to give you more opportunities to showcase your football and skills if you've already developed them to the required level. It's not really one or the other. It doesn't yeah. have to be one or the yeah. other. It can be both. Yeah. That's what I felt anyway. Um, and I've seen it even with fellow county players who would have had would have had good physical qualities. Um, but ball skills weren't that great but over time ball skills are now at another level simply because their physical qualities have allowed them to go out and improve that area as well I know that probably mightn't make sense to some people but I think that's true and then obviously it's vice versa as well well they'll have more space if they're faster yeah. like and, and they'll exactly get on more ball if they're better conditioned yeah and then even well I think, I think I just think it's silly to to not make use of it, um, and there's probably players out there too who have unbelievable skill level, club level, but just don't really care about that side of things and don't really want to push on, and that's fine as well. Like, um, but but lads want to do it as well as the other thing, like yeah, because there's been a lot of chat in the last couple of weeks. Too about like oh it's gone too professional or whatever and I know this is talked dead at this stage but like there's a level for everyone do you know like if you don't yeah. want to do it you don't have to do it but you can't say I want to play senior football and then not do it <laughs> well sorry you're not at the required level to play senior football yeah. it's not like everything is available to you to do what you want and you can just go off and do your own thing and then expect it. You can do that if you want, but you better be fucking good. <laughs> do you know? I think when when players start struggling to make teams and stuff, that's when they probably realise that they need to be doing it. Um, and then they might get frustrated for not doing it. But as you said, like you have a choice at the end of the day, whether you want it or you don't. Um, some players make more use of that than others. Fair play to them. Um, I don't think you can really look down on someone for for going and, and trying to make teams and stuff just by improving physical qualities. Um, there's just that much stuff out there now um, in terms of in the realm of speed and conditioning, change direction, as you know yourself. Mm. You're probably helping athletes every day of the week yeah. improve all those aspects and, and get to higher levels. Um, and I think that's just the way it's gone now. And it's the way it's going to go further that way. Um, but it doesn't mean players can't go and get unbelievably good at, at, at the skill level as well you can do both as you said well you should be integrating both like it comes back to the conversation I had with David Gray about uh, skill development and like I'm not saying only work on speed and change of, change of direction or agility 
I'm saying work on those and work on your ball skills because you, we're talking a lot about physical qualities and those being physical qualities. They're also skills. Yeah. So you're not going to get better at them if you don't practice. So I'm not telling my lads and ladies to get up to the pitch and only do your speed and agility stuff. I'm telling them, get up a half an hour earlier, 20 minutes earlier, get your 10 minutes of closed speed and change of direction stuff. Then maybe get the balls out and you can do 10 minutes or, or whatever you want, five minutes with the ball in a closed scenario and then integrate the two of them together yeah. and do shooting at speed because we all know like lads can be great to kick a ball over the bar when there's no pressure on them, but then yeah. ask them to do it on the run or ask them to do it with a defender, even in their vicinity. And mm-hmm. it's going out for a sideline. Like there's so many, there's so many ways you can integrate all them things. Um, even when you look at the top intercounty players at the minute, Shane Walsh, David Clifford, in my opinion, what separates them is their ability to change direction at a hundred, like when everything is manic um, and create space for themselves. So, Training the two of them at the same time on your own before a session can go a long way uh, to, to getting better. Um, but yeah, I think sometimes when people look at these things, they think it's either one or the other again. Um, like if you're going out and doing your speed and your change of direction, you're, you're, you're losing out in time where you should be working on your skills. Um, but it's about again learning how to do how to do both and then learning how to integrate them as well. And like I get the question about deceleration all the time. Like, are you working on decelerating in an isolated setting? And I might with like a return to play or a rehab or, and I might with an athlete that's healthy as well. But if you watch Shane Walsh and how he often beats the defender, he uses one similar scenario a lot of the time. And I'm seeing more players try it now where he'll accelerate into the space. Then he's actually decelerating as fast as he can jams on the brakes so that the player goes past them and then the useful thing about being both footed is he'll just cut in on whatever foot he he yeah. is on and knock it over the bar and you can do that pre-training and just practice it with one of the lads or one of the ladies passively defending you so running after you and then just following and then you're cutting inside and then trying to knock it over and in doing that you're working on your acceleration your deceleration and you're getting some skill work in as well. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying you should be doing integrated all the time, but maybe at the start, you're doing Axel or Decel on its own, then start building up towards the game. Because if we're going to improve at the game, we should be probably improving the specificity of our training and training in relevant scenarios. Because what's going to happen when you're presented with that scenario on match day? Yeah. And like I heard Shane Walsh talking in his. GA social about they're getting good airtime here. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great podcast. He talks about what he does away from the pitch is what separates him mm-hmm. when he gets to the field. And when you're training three days a week with a team setting, you very rarely get to practice those scenarios where you're taking a man up the line and you're working on that deceleration and, and cutting inside or whatever it is, or you're you're working on a sidestep with the ball. You never get to work on that in a team session. So the only time you're actually going to get better at it is away from the field and it's evident that Shane Walsh and those boys are doing this on their own on the pitch it's not just a complete random skill that he's been born with like you know which is the easy out I think yeah the easy out is right and Shane probably knows deep down himself that it's because he's put hours and hours and hours working on all of these things both his right foot his left foot has changed the direction yeah you know. And accumulates as well because lads are like, well, he's not doing it at the moment because he's so busy, he's playing county and whatever. But he's already got the money in the bank because yeah. he's been doing it for ten years. Exactly. Whereas you can't just say, oh well, he's at that level, so I'm not going to even try and improve. And I know we had a bit of a back and forth about the goal in the in the final. Was <laughs> that something that you've thought about? Because you said, ah, I finally got a bit of a sidestep to me, like. <laughs> Has it been something that's been maybe in your head, you've been visualising it, or have you done a few reps? Because you've obviously been limited in what you can do with the, the groin issue. It's It wasn't in that scenario. It's definitely not something I've worked on that much in terms of a goal opportunity. In terms of steps, like I've, I've been doing those in games out the pitch off either foot for a long time now. Probably not much, as much this year as I wanted to because of the injury. 
um, and I haven't been able to get out to the pitch on my own or do do any extras. But it's probably it's, it's a sort of goal you do visualize, just dreaming about scoring goals because just the way it happened, where you just you get the ball, you you sell a few defenders and just rolled into the net. So I don't know if that was anything to do with it, but um, it just I don't it was kind of a blur that that goal to be honest, it just but it, non-conscious. Yeah, but it was probably I, I've definitely worked on that sort of step on my own at the pitch many a time. Um, I suppose that's probably why you do it. So it's those sort of moments where it comes off for you. And if you don't develop off both feet as well, then you're going to be pretty predictable from game day. The step? Yeah. Yeah. That's probably, I'd probably do have a side that I'd step more off and I've been told that in the past. So, um, yeah, having, having two ways to go. Um, like like kicking off either foot, it's it's gonna be a lot better um and harder to defend as well. Um like if, if a team's watching your video and you're always stepping off one leg going one way, it's gonna be fairly easy to, to predict and, and to see it coming. So it's something that's another easy enough thing to work on in your own time, um, away from training sessions. Um, even if you have someone there with you to, to practice. And they'll get some reps as a defender as well. You can go uncontested at the start and then go con- completely contested and, and, and bring in the chaos and that's where you get to try things and you develop as a footballer as, exactly. as the lads <laughs> like Sean watch you to do um, but like I know you, like we're in a similar role in that we're both strength and conditioning coaches both working you, you mainly in an online setting me somewhat in an online setting and I know that you're from that conversation we've just had you're a keen learner and you're keen at developing new things all the time. Is there any rabbit holes you've been going down in terms of learning in the past or in the last, say, few weeks? Because I know you've been working with Sam, haven't you? Sam yeah, Portland. Sam Portland stuff is something that I've been trying to find the time to, to learn more about. Um, still haven't done nearly as much as I'd like to, but in terms of that realm, it's just about learning more about specific strength within the gym. And Sam's massive for for not doing too many back squats. I know I was down at a speed a speed course in Derry. I mean, he picked on me for the full hour <laughs> over the, the full six hours maybe. Um, about just and he, he's just right about about players doing too much general strength work and not actually thinking about what like the, the strength that you're going to need when you're you you're in a in a match or in a training session or when you're accelerating and. Mm-hmm. That speed specific strength is something that's kind of interested me a lot. Um, he's big on the wall drills and stuff, and how to develop them and and, and drill stacking and stuff like that, has been very interesting. Um, and something I'm gonna try and probably explore over the next number of months. The fact that I've had the injury probably hasn't helped me in that realm either. Just trying to, trying to do it yourself first and feel it uh, mm. before you start, you know, bringing it out towards your your online clients. Um. I haven't really been doing that realm just yet because of that reason. And the other thing as well is that we better preface this way is you need the general quality first. Yeah. You have developed Sorry. the general quality before you go down to specific rabbit hole, but you need a sprinkle of both then. Like yeah. whereas people know the compounds and they're trained in them and they're like, I'm pretty good at these. So they just probably hammer them yeah. till the cows come home, whereas they're not getting much out of it and as Dave said on the podcast they're maybe getting a net negative transfer out of it you get to that level obviously like you need you need the basic level of strength especially for young lads coming through um, you're going to get a lot from from the general strength qualities and um, that you build up over time and then when you get to that level after a couple of years then it's it's about you know, you know thinking like where is where am I going to get more from from the gym Um. And I fell into that trap as well of just hammering the same things for years and thinking that you're getting better just by getting stronger. But realistically, you're probably not. And you're, you're probably taken away from from other aspects. Um, like I would have spent a lot of time just doing too much in the gym and actually going into training and, and games sore from the gym, which is like when you think about it, it's completely crazy, like completely crazy to go into even, even in pre-season and stuff where you're trying to, trying to develop conditioning and uh, and speed qualities and you're going into sessions fatigued and sore, like it doesn't make that much sense at all. Especially when you've developed to a level where you've you're at a size that you're happy with, you're at a level of strength that you're that you're happy with. Um 
then it's about about going and, and trying to develop, I suppose, them specific strength qualities um, inside the gym. And that's where I'm actually also looking forward to exploring um, over the next number of months. And over the next few weeks as you build for the Talbot Cup. Yeah. But it, it like it is a bit of a no-brainer in the way that the game is being played at the moment. And I again I know I'm biased, but football's in an amazing place at the moment. The games at the weekend were phenomenal. Yeah. But what was standing out was the speed of play, the speed of transition is class. And if we had the period previously where players got really big and really strong and they're just trying to physically dominate teams and not let lads through and whatnot. Now we may be moving to a phase, if you contrast it with rugby, where the player size might actually come down a tiny bit and lads might lean out a little bit more to cover more ground at a higher speed and to transition faster and get through more high-speed running mm-hmm. to be more effective in the game. And hopefully it's going to be spell the end of these debates on RTE about how the game is is dying and a death and people aren't interested and it's boring because he's what went on at the weekend was not boring at all. So if we can get athletes even faster, yeah, it undoubtedly undoubtedly won't be in any way boring. It'll be more entertaining as a spectacle. Yeah. I think we're, like what we're seeing now is we're still seeing fairly defensive setups and things, but we're seeing teams that have now nearly mastered breaking them down mm. with speed, change of direction. Mm different even like the thing that the craze in GA at the minute is the the check or the cut in behind um to open up defenses. I know we were caught with this about five times at the weekend and I know the first goal was was to do with the check. Um but I think we're getting to that stage now where as you said the actual physical size isn't isn't as important. I think we're starting to see that to be honest with players in the pitch. Um like I even think with myself in games like when do I actually use my physical strength? Probably a kickouts and stuff, I would still fairly use it. But a lot of players are are massive now, and well, not massive now, but are still holding quite a bit of size. But if you look in the game situation, they're not actually using it all that much. It's more the, it's more the the, the ability to accelerate and decelerate quickly, change direction, all of those things. Um, and then the conditioning side of things is still at an all time high. Yeah, to be honest, and but. We can hammer that till the cows come home. Mm. As we touched on earlier, you need to be able to execute the game plan at speed, make decisions, change direction, but you need to be able to do it repeatedly, I suppose. So the conditioning is also a prerequisite. But it's clear, like with the online coaching, with the inter county GAA, with the online learning and whatnot, you have a lot on your plate. Like, do you ever struggle with everything? Because obviously lads are just ripping into you and saying you're in coffee shops all day. <laughs> but like they don't see all of the clients you're dealing with, all the people you're dealing with on a daily basis, and then all of the continual learning that you're doing and trying to upskill and get better. Yeah, that's that's plus the, the tough, rehab. The tough part. Um plus the rehab. Yeah. <laughs> plus my thoughts being bombarded just with with the injury constantly when you're when you're playing at a high level. I think that's it's only natural if you do pick up a niggle that it's going to go through your head always. But no, um, the, like it's funny because no one's ever really going to see probably what you're doing. They're just seeing you sitting there at a laptop or at a desk, um, not in not somewhere that you know is so called normal, like at a workspace. Um, but I think I'm at a stage now where it's it's quite a lot, um, at times, and it's it's just about time management, um. Like nearly every single evening is taken up just with with inter county. So I think at the moment it's my whole time is actually spent with dealing with clients, talking to clients, um, you know, program design, and the difficult parts actually finding time, as you said, for the extra learning, um, that is needed to I suppose to keep developing and improving, um, and and developing systems I suppose within the online the online coaching, yeah, and something that I I'd, I'd love to start getting into more is is obviously the the one to one stuff um in terms of the speed development and and that side of things um I suppose is, is something that I've been limited with and even as I said like the, the actual learning like in terms of the, as we spoke about before getting the seminars and stuff and um and meeting new coaches and stuff that like that's kind of something that I'd, I'd miss out on big time 
um, with being involved with county setups and stuff. Um, when do you get time to yourself as well, though? Like, is this week just like you feel nearly idle because you're usually so gung ho and all go all the time? Or is your time to yourself your training time? Yeah, my time to myself is probably training, uh, training, going to training, going to the gym. Like, that's just, like you enjoy that massively. Um, probably haven't enjoyed it much this year because I've been going to training and having to just sit there and do yeah. nothing or going to the gym and do rehab. That's been a bit of a killer this year, to be honest. Um, you, you'd be sitting in the gym in your own at times, just yeah. doing rehab. Um, I, I suppose the, the content creation side is that things that take a bit, like a lot out of me at times as well. That would go just always having to provide that online. Um, Presence, like yeah, having to, having to be be active online um, is a big thing, and would probably take a right bit out of me at times, mm. but. Again, I'd still would have time to myself and, and meeting. I'd still get like like during the day, during the week, like I'm not tied down all the time. Um I'd have plenty of time to go and go for lunch or whatever, go for coffee, just as well. You're not doing yourself any favors about this podcast, are you? Um I'm killing your list. Yeah, you're dead, right? <laughs> and that's something as well though that stands out about you is you don't hear it at all what people really say about you is that something that's been natural or something that kind of you focused on because you've spoke about wanting to be as the lads put it the heir apparent to, to <laughs> god he's thrown like you want to be the number one forward you want to go and win an Ulster championship is that something that's as we talked about earlier a little bit generational and that the younger lads are more willing to speak about what they're going at or is it something that you've been like actively pursuing I think it's just naturally as a human like you you're always going to have those those thoughts come in your head that you shouldn't be doing this you shouldn't be expressing your thoughts or but i think you just realize after a while like no one really cares like no one everyone has their own stuff going on um is anyone actually going to care if i express what i want maybe for a split second they might give out about it but no one actually no one no one cares and um, it's something that if, I wouldn't say it came naturally to me just expressing all those things and, and saying what I feel but um, over time just constantly doing it I suppose having social media as well has probably helped that side of things just realising that when you do put something out that you might think you might think people would you know kick a fuss up about and then you put it out and no one says anything or nothing happens off it you just realise like it doesn't matter like it does not matter um, and I suppose it's, you should be expressing, you know, those sort of things and what you want to do and where you want to go. Um, so you can even have that belief in yourself. The more you say it, the more you're going to believe it. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't say it's something I've actively been going and trying to change either. It's just naturally happened. Probably has just naturally happened over time. Um, well, I th- well, I think back to when I first was probably creating Instagram and stuff it might not have naturally happened at that, that stage but then again I wouldn't say I went and forced it either big time I think it was just repetition over time with the volume and with the reps get the reps in same as the same yeah. uh, but something that maybe has been a little bit clearer is that you have a very active brain because you've mentioned overthinking on a few podcasts, you've mentioned it here as well, and that you've mentioned that sometimes you have so many ideas and so many things going in different directions that it can get a bit much and you have, have to actually just focus in on what's important. And as you said yesterday, control the controllables. Mm-hmm. Has the time and the space in the gym doing the rehab given you ample time for overthinking? And is that something that you've been trying to work on is maybe get a little bit better at controlling the controllables and not thinking too deeply about everything. Yeah. Like, as you said, when you're in a gym doing rehab on your own, it's nearly impossible to, to not overthink things. Um, I wouldn't say I'm a massive overthinker, but like anyone else, at times, certain stages, you start to overthink, and then it's just about implementing certain things to try and... Try and not overthink as well like certain journaling or meditating or cold water or improving your sleep or like you know, I, I'm, I'm fairly good with realizing what i need to do to 
to prevent those things. Well, it's not even prevent them. I suppose they're always going to be there, mm. but to deal with them better. Um, but yeah, I think it's only natural when you're, I suppose, struggling with an injury at that level that you're going to overthink things. Um, and you're going to think like you're going to worry about whether you're going to be in the shape to play, whether you're going to, and um, whether people are going to be thinking about it. But um, as I said, I'm I'm fairly good at dealing with them like at this stage. I'd say it's refreshing for people to hear that as well that that goes through inter county players' heads, mm -hmm. because sometimes fans think they're that you're superhuman, yeah. like yeah. Uh, I think they, that probably is a struggle though as well, is it? In that like people are like, oh sure, he's grand, he's strong, he plays county for Fermanagh, he'll be one hundred percent. Probably is. Um, yeah, I don't know. People probably just think everyone at, at that level is just as you said, super strong and. Um, would never have those sort of things and uh, that's why I can never really understand when people from the outside would give so much criticism to, to players at a high level um, for not performing and not doing all those things like when they don't realise that you know players have a lot going on themselves I'm not saying I do but <laughs> I'm sure there's players out there at the highest level that struggle big time um, and are getting criticised constantly and um, they're doing what, everything they can like, you're literally doing you literally are spending every hour of your day nearly thinking about when you are involved in that bubble at a, at a high inter county level um, you nearly always have something to think about in terms of performing because like league means a lot championship means a lot so for six months of the year you're constantly thinking about how can I perform on the pitch or how can I be the best um, so yeah it's it, Probably. Doesn't stop. Doesn't stop. It's like dairy, relentless. <laughs> <laughs> Relentlessly relentless. Yeah, exactly. Right. So we'll move on to the quick four questions to finish. First one is proudest achievement to date. Yeah, I had to think about that. In terms of proudest achievements, probably was with my club when I first came in. Uh, we won back to back championships, the junior and the intermediate, got up to senior level. So I was that was probably the biggest achievement to date. Um, hopefully the next biggest would be going on and winning a senior championship in my club um, and, and winning silverware with Fermanagh which we haven't done in a long long time as I said. not since you've been you've had 25 years since the Yeah, over 25 and you're 24 are you? yeah <laughs> <laughs> round about time so. yeah exactly favourite athlete of all time Favourite athlete of all time is Usain Bolt. <laughs> I just loved watching him when I was younger. I used to be absolutely buzzing for the Olympics every time. Um, but there's just something unbelievable about watching someone run unbelievably fast. <laughs> yeah. And some element of it, like people will always say, is genetics. But what they think is that Usain Bolt isn't training. They <laughs> just yeah. born like that. Yeah. But like... It's like, like executing every single time. And it's the most everything he's thing. doing, similar to you, is geared, but different to you. Yeah. <laughs> is it is it's geared towards something that takes less than 10 seconds? Yeah, I know. That, that's madness. the craziest thing. The fact that it's just over like that, and he's trained for years and years and years. Um and one and just, one opportunity, like one opportunity. The ball doesn't come in again for him. <laughs> <laughs> Must get better at dealing with the one ball in. But anyway, I just think like even just the character that he is. Like such a cool, cool man. Like, yeah. um, and then he's the fastest man in the world. Like, it's it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah, it'll be a while till he's bet. What's the biggest thing that you've learned in the last twelve months? Biggest thing learned in the last twelve months. Um, if you thought I thought of it, <laughs> uh, Yeah, actually, what I learned in the last 12 months was probably when I went overseas to America, realizing that there's more out there. Um, and, and the fact that you need to travel and you need to go and do things when you're young, because you're not going to be young, you know, when you're 33 or 40, like you, you're going to be more than likely tied up in some way, shape or form, whether it's your job or relationships or whatever. Um and the fact that I'm 24 now and I've absolutely no ties really apart from inter-county football, um, I feel like I need to go and explore a bit more. You're 100% right. The only thing I was going to add was 
it might not be a healthy thing to use the term tied up in relation <laughs> to, to relationships and uh, and professional life as well because a lot of the time that's also a choice mm-hmm. yeah so exactly. it's a useful that's just true, mental right? framework to maybe change yeah. I don't know but that's me nitpicking but yeah I, I 100% agree with you like I wouldn't have the experiences that are the knowledge that I do or the self-awareness even without that travel because you realize as you said yeah. there's a whole other world out there and it probably leads to you realizing that the world is massive and nobody cares as well exactly. so do what you want be yeah. who you want to be exactly like even when I was when you're younger you kind of know that you've been told that oh you should go and explore but until you actually go and do it that's only when you realize like it's true <laughs> what would you tell your 18 year old self then a lot of things <laughs> um but just don't block yourself um like when i was 18 i knew what i was passionate about what i actually loved doing which was in this realm but i blocked myself into thinking that that's not how it should be and you're, you're supposed to do what you're good at um and i went and did a four-year degree in aerospace engineering when Deep down, like honestly, deep down from 18, 19, I knew that I wasn't going to be doing that for the next 20 years. And you're listening to outside voices, I suppose, coming in and, and trying to tell you that, you know, if you're good at maths, you should, you have to go down that realm. Like it's it's just crazy not to um, think of all the money that's in it. Like, but it's another thing. Um, don't choose a career path based on one thing just because you're good at something but also based off what the potential wage would be 20 years down the line because it makes fuck all difference yeah. am I allowed to curse in this point? yeah you would. I'd be cursing flat out so. <laughs> yeah yeah so that's that's what I'd probably tell me 18 year old self um, obviously it's not just about finding what you're passionate about I suppose a mix of that is, is probably a good thing as well Um what you're good at and you're passionate about and it's okay to change your mind as well and it's okay to change like I'm as I've said I've done four years with a degree now and I've been able to change no bother so as it, again if you make the wrong decision it's not the end of the world either 100% lots of lessons learned yeah. thanks a million for coming on Dara no bother Peter must be enjoyed it.